So coming, let me share my screen. Oh, by the way, I stopped the recording after Frank finished the lecture. So the question part doesn't get recorded in case you are worried about that. <laughs> Good. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, excellent. Yeah, today um, I want to continue from, from yesterday. Um, so yesterday we looked at yeah, linear programming and semi-definite programming um, in, the, in the eyes of uh, conic optimization. And today I want to focus a bit on yeah, conic optimization and on the complexity of, of conic optimization. So how difficult or how easy is it to solve conic optimization problems. So David already hinted at that yesterday, and today I want to show you some yeah, precise uh, theorems about it. Um, and after that, I want to show you how you can use especially the cone of positive semi-definite matrices to say something interesting about lattices. And later we want to use this to say something interesting about lattices and packings and covering. Okay, so introduction to conic optimization. So recap from yesterday, some conic optimization. Um, so as also Henry said, I want to uh, make it a bit independent of yesterday. So I recall um, yeah, the things you need to understand uh, material for today. Um, so the setup is we have some Euclidean vector space E, this inner product. And we have some proper convex cone inside of it, which defines the domain of positivity. And then, yeah, this is enough to, to say what the primal uh, form of a conic optimization problem looks like. So it's a maximization problem in my setting. I think it was a minimization problem yesterday in David's setting, but of course, these things are equivalent. Um, and then you want to find P star, the supremum of this optimization problem here on the right hand side. So you're given a, a vector C, you're given vectors AJ and right hand side BJ. And then you want to maximize the inner product between C and X. X is the optimization variable, which lies in the Euclidean space E, which is greater or equal than zero with respect to the cone. So it lies in the cone and it should satisfy some linear condition, um, which means that <coughs> it lies in some affine subspace. So the picture, kind of the, the easy picture is here on the right hand side, you have a cone, you intersect it with some affine subspace, you get the intersection and then you want to move a point in the direction of C as far as possible, so, as it's, so long as it stays in the, in the gray region here. Yeah, if you now specify the cone, you get different kinds of optimization problems, different kinds of classes of optimization problems. And for us today, yeah, the cone of positive semi-definite matrices will play an important role. So then in this setting, we have E to be the Euclidean space of uh, symmetric matrices, n times n. The inner product is a trace inner product. And the cone K, which is interesting to us, is a cone of positive semi-definite matrices. That's probably the, the most important cone for, for, for my lectures. Um, another important cone, which is a variant of the STP cone, is a max depth cone, where we have an extra uh, variable to the symmetric matrix. And then the cone is simply all pairs x comma s, where the determinant of x to the power one divided by n is greater or equal than s. Yeah, so you give a lower bound for the determinant of x. And you have this funny exponent 1 divided by n. Um, this is, you need, um, if you want to prove that k is indeed in a convex cone. So I think this works for one of the exercises. And the last cone, which is also interesting to us, is a cone for polynomial optimization. So it's all polynomials in n variables of degree d, it's homogeneous. You have this funny looking inner product, and then the cone is the cone of all non negative polynomials. It's also an important cone, and the cone um, David discussed yesterday at length. So, this is a very interesting and very important cone, especially for global uh, polynomial optimization. 
Okay, so this is conic optimization in different flavors with different cones. And now I want to discuss a few minutes the computational complexity of this. So how difficult is it to solve semi definite programming problems, max set problems, or polynomial optimization problems in, in theory or in, in practice? So first of all, the, the bad news about algorithms and complexity. Um, so conic programs can be difficult for so NP hard to solve. So we don't expect any polynomial time algorithms to solve arbitrary conic um, programs. Yeah, that's maybe a bit surprising because conic programs are uh, convex optimization problems and the convex optimization problems have the big advantage that every local minimum is at the same time a global minimum. So you can imagine that if you want to solve a conic optimization problem, you would just do gradient descent and then just solve it. How can this be difficult? So how can this be not polynomial time? And in fact, yeah, it's probably not polynomial time because uh, there are many ways to, to prove this uh, by a polynomial time reduction. So yesterday, David already gave you one reduction. Uh, so he reduced um, independent sets to polynomial optimization. So today I want to show you a different uh, reduction from an even simpler problem. And the simpler problem is the partition problem. So I want to show you a polynomial time reduction from the NP complete partition problem to polynomial optimization. Um, so the partition problem is one of the famous um, yeah, um, NP complete problems which were found by the CARP. And what does it, does it do? So it's a decision problem and you are given a vector C with N components or natural numbers. And now the question is, do, does there exist an X which has only minus one and plus one entries so that C transpose X is equal to zero? Or in other words, can you partition the vector C in two components so that their sums are the same? And the vector X decides if the component lies on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side. Yeah, so then in the 70s, Richard Karp proved for a lot of problems that they are NP-complete. So he, here on the right-hand side, you see the diagram. And um, so he reduced the sub-problem satisfiability to all these different kinds of problems. And the partition problem is somewhere here at the, at the bottom of this, of this, um, of this tree. So it's an empty complete problem and we don't expect to have any good uh, polynomial, optimal, uh, polynomial time algorithms uh, to solve arbitrary instances for partition. And um, now we reduce partition to polynomial optimization. So in particular, partition has a positive answer. So there exists a vector X having this property if and only if this following maximization problem has t equal to zero as an optimal solution. So what does it do? So you want to have a polynomial with n variables of degree four. So we want to look at the cone P and four. So polynomials which are non-negative um, on n variables. And then you want to make that this polynomial here so C transpose X to the power four. So you see C transpose X is also part of the partition problem. Plus now some funny looking things plus N times sum X I to the four minus sum X I squared to the power two minus T should be uh, non-negative. And then it's an exercise. So you see it here on the right <coughs> upper corner. It's an exercise to see that this maximization problem has t as an optimal as t equal to zero as an optimal solution if and only if partition has a solution. Yeah, if you look at this polynomial here, it's not too hard to see that um, this polynomial is always strictly positive because of the powers four and so on. But now the, the claim is that um, the supremum is of the entire thing is equal to zero if and only if. Um, the partition problem has an optimal solution. 
yeah, it's an exercise. Um, and the hint is, yeah, as usual, I think the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. Hello. Oh, somebody wants to do studies. Somebody gives advice. Oh. Somebody here. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know who is here at this moment. Uh, okay, so no question. So let's continue. So that's these are the bad news. So an even an, the NP complete problem partition you can reduce to polynomial optimization. So it's going to be probably very hard um, to optimize over the cone of uh, non negative polynomials. So this cone is a difficult cone. But there are also good news, and that's what I want to discuss now. And the good news is that for many other cones, um, you can solve conic optimization problems in polynomial time, at least under some mild technical assumptions. And this is true for the LP cone, for the SOCP cone, so the cone coming from the Lorentz cone, for the STP cone, and for the Maxwell cone. Um, now, all of these four cones um, can prove. One question. Yes. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, in the chat, no one question uh, What is P and 4 in this setting? Uh, if you go, you mean here? Back here? Should be the non negative polynomials and n variables, and I think decree less than four. Exactly. So PN4 is the cone which we had on the slide before. Show this. Um, should be yeah, here. PND. So these are n variables, degree equal to four, it's homogeneous, and then you want to have homogeneous polynomials of degree four, which are non negative. Uh, you want to have all polynomials f having the property f of x greater equal than zero for all x in our end. Now, and one can show that this is a proper convex code with all these polynomials which are non negative, homogeneous of degree d when d is even, um, is a proper convex code. Okay, that's a difficult cone. So even when the degree is four, it's already difficult. Of course, when the degree is higher, it's getting even more difficult. But the thing is that when d is four, it's already difficult. Yeah, then the good news again. So these four cones, you can solve optimization problems in polynomial time. And I would say it's it's good news in theory and practice. I mean, first of all, in theory, we can prove, really by mathematical proof, that there's a polynomial time algorithm for solving all these problems. But also in practice, there are many good solvers which solve um, conic optimization problems over these cones um, very efficiently. Okay, and now I want to show you a statement um, that the STP cone can be optimized over in polynomial time. So it's a bit technical, but I think it's important to see it once um, because then you are hopefully convinced, especially if you see a proof um, that this is an important tool for optimization. So now I want to focus on the STP case, but all other cases you can formulate very similar theorems. Okay, so what do we do? So we consider a primal semi-definite program. So P star, so supremum inner product between C and X. Now everything is capital because we, deal with, we are dealing with um, uh, matrices. Then X, the optimization variable, should be a positive semi definite matrix and it should satisfy some linear conditions given by matrices A1 up to AM and given by right hand sides, numbers B1 up to BM. And then we assume that all this data, the input data, C A1 up to AM, B1 up to BM is rational. So you can encode things um, uh, binary without, um, in binary without um, losing any information. Yeah, so that's the input. And it should be binary encodable because we want to solve 
um, these problems on the Turing machine. And Turing machines are the abstractions of, of computers using only uh, binary uh, digits. Okay, then another assumption. Suppose we have a rational point x0, which is feasible, which lies in F. And suppose we have rational numbers, small r and, and capital R, so that the ball around x0 with its radius r lies completely inside of the feasibility region. And suppose that the ball with radius capital R lies completely outside of the feasibility region. So it encloses and completely the feasibility region. So in particular, we know by assumption that the feasibility region is a compact, a compact set. Okay, so suppose we have a small ball, small ball sitting inside of the feasibility region, and we know that the feasibility region itself is enclosed in a, in a big ball. Okay, and then we fix some positive rational number, epsilon, and this epsilon um, gives a measure and how good the, the optimum or how good the, the solution should be, so how close it should be to the optimum. And then given all this data, one can find in polynomial time a rational matrix X star so that if you look at the objective value of x star, so the inner product between c and x star, and you look at this value and you um, take the difference to the optimal value, then this should be less equal than epsilon. So you come epsilon close to the optimal solution. Yeah, so this you can find in polynomial time. And polynomial time in the input, namely in the input n, the dimension of the, of the entire problem and the number of um, constraints uh, then you, you look to look at the logarithm of the, the quotient capital R divided by small r and you look at the, the log of one divided by epsilon and you look at the bit size of the data x0 c a1 up to a m b1 up to yeah, so it's a rather technical statement, but the upshot is that you can solve semi-definite programming in polynomial time up to some given um, error epsilon, and everything is polynomial in the input data. And the mild technical assumption is that you have a small ball and a big ball uh, around the feasibility region. This looks a bit artificial at the beginning, but I will show you an example where it makes a lot of sense to have, to have this condition. Um, then we find the rational matrix X star, and one can ask the question if, uh, so why can't we find an optimal solution? So why are we only epsilon close with this rational solution? And the answer is that in general, um, optimal solutions of semi definite programs are not rational matrices. So these are matrices, one can prove that they have algebraic numbers as, as, as entries, but usually they are not, um, they're not rational. But we can find a rational solution in polynomial time, which comes arbitrarily close um, to the optimal solution. Um, so there are proofs of this. And the first proof, and that's also the most easy and common proof, is the proof using the Lipsert method. And this goes back to Gretchen, Lobert, and Schreiber. Um, the drawback is that the Lipsert method is rather, um, I would say, uh, yeah, a theoretical algorithm and is not so useful in practice. But nevertheless, it shows that there exists an algorithm which runs in polynomial time. And here we have some pictures of Gretchen lowest Schreiber from right to left. Um, but usually, and since 20 years, um, semi-definite programs are solved by a different kind of algorithm, namely the TRI point algorithm. And uh, for, for this, it was not so clear if it runs in polynomial time in the bit model. But together with Etienne de Clerc, uh, we proved this a couple of years ago. 
uh, based on yeah, the analysis of interior point methods by Nesterov and Engorovsky, also from right to left. So there are, there are two different proofs that you can solve semi definite programs in polynomial time using different algorithms. Um, there's a Lipsert method gives a, a not so complicated proof and the interior point method uh, gives a more complicated but also a more practical um, tool. And now some words about the technical assumption that you have a small ball, a small ball and a big ball around the feasibility region. And this is indeed needed because of this example here. So if you look at this example, then this should be a positive semi-definite matrix of size 2n times 2n, where we have a block diagonal structure with 2 times 2 blocks. And these 2 times 2 blocks have the form 1 xi minus 1, xi minus 1, xi. And the very first x0 is defined as equal to 2, 2. And then if you want to have a positive semi-definite matrix of this form, uh, then it's an easy exercise to see that then this implies that the coordinate xi should be at least 2 to the 2 to the i. So it should be double exponential in i. Frank, there's yeah. one question. Okay. Uh, is the interior point proof for all the cones or for SDP only? Um, so the proof we give works for SDP only, um, but I mean, but um, SOCP and LP are special cases of SDP, so it automatically works for LP and SOCP. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that obvious modifications also make it work for MaxSet. I mean, nobody wrote it down yet, um, but it will work out. Okay, and there was a second question. What is known about the best degrees of the polynomials for SDP in N and M, say? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think there's a paper by Stromfels and me who look at this. Uh, and they, I think, give uh, the degrees uh, for generic semi-definite programs. And I think they are pretty bad, uh, but I would have to look at the paper. Okay. Yeah, so I can, can, can dig it out and give the answer kind of, uh, later today. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I was just motivating that these um, technical assumptions are needed simply because I mean, if you look at these yeah, not too compli complicated semi-definite program, then it forces you to have entries which are double exponential in the, in, the, in the input size. And if you have a double exponential number in the input size, you cannot encode it polynomially in the bit size. So you would use exponential bit size there. And to exclude this kind of examples from the theorem, we have this assumption of the small ball and the big ball, especially having the big ball. The small ball is a different technical assumption and you can get rid of it, but the, the, the big ball, I think at the moment there's no way to get, to get along. More questions? A question came in from the forum. Mm -hmm. These balls uh, around x naught, are they with respect to the given inner product on E? Yes, indeed. Yeah. So the balls are given with respect to the Euclidean structure on, on E. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I have a question, sure. uh, Frank. So is it uh, is it not, so you say like that it's the big ball that uh, that uh, excludes this example of the double exponential uh, numbers that you gave but is it the interior point is also excluding this right because if you need an interior point 
x0, it's also going to be double exponential. Or not. Oh, yeah, sure, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's because be you don't have to know the big, uh, do you? I don't remember if you have to know the big R for the, arc for the algorithm. I think you do, right? You do, yeah. You do, yeah, right, okay. The small R you don't need to know, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a way around to play the small R. And if you look at the book by Kochelow was I think they have an entire chapter on it. Yeah, the small R is not necessary, no. Okay, so, all right, thanks. But for our analysis, for the interior point, uh, we need the small R. Yeah. Good. Um, okay, then this was the part on yeah, the good news and the bad news for the algorithmic complexity. Um, then I have a couple of slides uh, for SCP applications, um, but I think I want to skip them because David already uh, did most of it. He didn't do the first example, the eigenvalue optimization, but I think I just want to skip it because I will not use it later. But I think it's nevertheless nice to, to have the slides um, available. And then if you, whenever you have an eigenvalue optimization problem, you should recall that there was a slide and then you can, can look it up. So using SCP, you can do eigenvalue optimization of symmetric matrices. Okay, that's the only thing you should remember here. And the second SAP application is polynomial optimization and sum of squares. And that's exactly what David was uh, talking about yesterday. And I don't want to add anything except maybe for pictures. So the inventors of this method are um, Lasser and Parillo, and here they are. And then the third SAP application is also David was illuminating and illustrating was approximating the independence number and the chromatic number. So he was talking about the independence number, but once you understand this, it's also not so hard to go to the chromatic number. Yeah, just the slides. Okay, so then let's go to some other application and more applications in the direction of, of the summer school. Now you want to look at lattices and, and I would look, want to look at um, a lattice reduction theory which is um, yeah, coming from a theory of, of Wobernoi. Yeah. yeah, famous Russian mathematician who got yeah, especially famous for his Wobernoi diagrams. And you see the Wobernoi diagrams here and uh, in the coin. Okay, so let's do this. So first of all, I want to look at lattices and I want to look at the parameter space of lattices. So what is a lattice? Yeah, a lattice is simply uh, the set of all integer combination of um, a basis of a vector space. So you have a basis of a vector space, B1 up to Bn. Then you take all integral linear combinations and then you get a lattice. So for example, the standard lattice Z2 you get by taking these two lattice vectors, B1 and B2. Then you take all integral linear combinations and then you will find that all these red points belong to the lattice. And of course, the lattice goes on to the left, to the right, up and to the bottom. And these lattices are useful because they define um, their point configurations in Rn and they are easy to describe because for this point configurations, you only have to specify the basis. And for many uh, geometric optimization problems like packings or coverings, sphere packings or sphere coverings, these lattices give optimal solutions. So then you have to imagine that this point configuration of the lattice gives the centers of spheres. Um, and then you want to maximize the density of, of a, a packing or you want to minimize the density of a covering. Okay, so that's a lattice, integral linear combination of a basis. And now we want to talk about the set of all lattices. So we want to optimize over all lattices, so we have to define what the parameter space of the lattices is. 
And here's the construction. So first of all, you have to look at the center here, G and N R. So all invertible n times n matrices. So here you have the lattice spaces. So you put in this matrix simply as columns all the lattice spaces vectors. Okay, but it can happen that different different matrices give you the same lattice. Yeah, for example, in this example, you have B1 and B2 as, is, as a lattice basis, but of course, there's an even better and easier lattice basis, namely B1 and the vector which you would kind of canonically, canonically take from here to there. So there are different kinds of, of bases. And to, to, to find out which uh, bases define the same letters, you have the lattice basis transformation. And that's a matrix of size n times n with integral coordinates and which is invertible. And if you have a lattice basis B, and then you do B times T with this um, element of GLNZ, you get the same lattice. Yeah? So you mod out GLNZ from the group GLNR. Okay, so this is one ident identification. And the other identification comes by orthogonal transformation. So if you take a lattice and if you rotate it, then you get, of course, a different lattice. But for many problems, for example, for sear packing problems, it doesn't matter which, in which direction you have to, in which direction you rotate the lattice, simply because spheres are rotationally invariant. So it makes sense to mod out from the other side uh, the orthogonal transformation, which leaves the distances invariant. And this entire structure here, GLNR, mod out to the right, GLNZ, mod out to the left, ON, that's a parameter space of lattices. Yeah, so that's the space we want to optimize over. And now you might ask the question, what is the relation now to conic optimization? And that's very simple because here, the quotient GLN R mod ON, this is nothing else as the cone of strictly positive definite matrices. So why that? Yeah, simply because if you have a basis and if you mod out ON, then it's enough to look at the gram matrix of the entire situation, the inner product matrix. And this inner product matrix is a positive definite, strictly positive definite matrix. Yeah, so at the end, you want to optimize over the cone of positive, strictly positive definite matrices, and then you mod out the discrete group GLNZ. So we do kind of, now we want to do kind of optimization over the cone of PSD matrices, but we mod out the discrete action of GLNZ. And this modding out of the discrete action we are discussing now. Any questions? Okay, so let's see. So reduction theory of lattices. Um, so now we want to discuss how the group GLNZ acts on the cone of positive definite matrices. Uh, and for this, and because we are dealing with integer numbers here, um, it's nicer to work with a rational closure of um, the cone of positive definite matrices. And that's a cone, and that's a cone spanned by the rank one matrices x times x transpose, where x is now um, a vector in z to the n. And that's a proper subcone of the cone of positive semi-definite matrices. So it would be the complete cone of positive semi-definite matrices if you would have an R here, but it's a proper subcone because you have a z. And the z makes sense because of the integrality of the group action GLNZ. Okay, and then, then GLNZ acts nicely on this rational closure. It acts by, by conjugation, G transpose QG, where Q is now an element in the rational closure. Okay, and then reduction theory of lattices, that's 
yeah, very old technique, basically going back to Gauss and even going back further. And then this, it's about finding a nice fundamental domain for this group action. Yeah, so you want to find fundamental you want to find the fundamental domain of the rational closure more GL and Z. Can I ask a short question? Sure. So this cone, this cone which you take with Z with X and Z N, is it like you take real conic combinations of these things? Real coefficients or what? Yes. But but then can't you oh, like wait a second, wait, wait a second. No, I think I take only Q. You ah, take rational combination because can't you just ab arbitrarily approximate anything? Like you can get a rational approximation of, then you can just take a very large number to make it all integer somehow. Um, Let me say it maybe, maybe it's not, good, not, not so good notation. So I want to take all positive definite matrices, strictly positive definite matrices, and then I will take the union with um, the rational cone given by X times X transpose. Ah, okay, so you take, ah, okay. So I want to have the strict positive definite matrices I want to have in the cone, but on the boundary, I only take care about rationality. Ah, uh, all right. So because the whole interior of the cone you get, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not an, it's not closed. It's not closed, the cone. It's not closed, exactly. Yeah, I understand. Okay, thanks. And uh, I think if you see the pictures later, you will see also <laughs> better what I mean. Okay, and then um, for the reduction theory of lattices, there are many different constructions known. And then interestingly, they all coincide for n is equal to two, and they're all somehow related to this picture here. And this will this picture will come up many times. And I took this picture from an old book by Stein and Fricke, just to say how old it is. Um, and then there's many constructions which are now coincide for for two, but no longer for 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 dimensions greater than two. So then it starts to differ. Yeah, and there are many names related to the reduction theories. So Minkowski gave one possibility of a reduction theory. Voronoi did it even two times. And then maybe the most recent reduction theory, very useful in computer science and also in the yeah, algorithmic number series by Lenstra, Lenstra, and Lovatz. But today I want to discuss, I would say the best reduction theory. And best, I mean the most expensive one. And that's Voronoi's second reduction theory. Most expensive, I mean, it's most expensive computationally. So it's very hard to compute it. Uh, but on the other hand, it gives the most information. So how does it look like? So Voronoi's second reduction theory. So again, this picture. So first of all, I take, in the picture, I take the cone of PSD matrices of dimension two times two. Uh, and then to make the pictures nice, I slice it with the slice of traces equal to one, the traces equal to one hyperplane. And then I get a circle here. And in the circle, I do the reduction theory. So I want to find the fundamental domain. So that's basically now the picture which comes from the Klein and Fricke book. So here is a cone, the slice. And for orientation, I gave you a couple of matrices. So the center matrix, of course, is a multiple of the identity because it should be traces equal to one. I have a half and a half on the diagonal. And here on the boundary, on the boundary, you have some rank one matrices. Um, for example, here, the matrix is zero, 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 one. On the other hand, I have one, zero, zero. Or I have the matrix on top. It's a half minus a half minus a half and a half. And here on the boundary, I only want to look at matrices having yeah, rational, rational data. And then the properties of Voronoi's second reduction theory will be as follows. 
First of all, it will be an infinite polyhedral face-to-face -face tiling. Um, so let's make some nice drawings. I don't see my mouse, so it's not, a, not possible. Now I lost my mouse. Sorry for that. One second. Um, let's do it again. Okay, so let's do it again in, in a smaller mode. So, so the fundamental domain will be one of these small triangles here. For example, oops. this small triangle here. And if you look at the cone picture, it will be a complete yeah, triangular uh, polyhedron going to infinity. And this polyhedra will be face to will be a face to face tiling. So if you intersect two of the polyhedra, um, they intersect uh, on the boundary and they intersect in a complete entire face. Yeah, so this will give us a nice polyhedral face to face tiling. And in the setting of dimension two, all this triangular polyhedra are dl to z equivalent. So at the end of the day, in dimension two. Um, the fundamental domain is simply this triangle here. In higher dimensions, uh, this is no longer the case. Things are more complicated. You get more different kinds of, of polyhedra and it's like that. Okay, so now the question is, Uh, the question is how is this reduction theory defined? So how are these triangles defined? And these are defined by a construction of Delaunay polyhedra. That's the last thing I want to discuss today. So here's Delaunay, the famous Russian mathematician coming with different ways to write them down, like Chebyshev, but not as bad as. Um, and it's an empty sphere construction. So it's also a construction which is very important in um, algorithmic geometry. So what's the Delaunay polyhedron of a, of a um, yeah, positive semi-definite matrix Q? So you take the convex hull of points, of lattice points, V1, V2, and so on. So all the VIs by in Zn. And then you want to have that this polytope or this polyhedron is um, that the sphere around it doesn't contain any further lattice points. Okay, so you want to have the following situation. You want to have a center C and the radius R so that with respect to Q, all the lattice points VI lie on the sphere of radius R and all the other lattice points lie outside. So for example, in this setting here, this gray area is a delaunay polyhedron because you can find the center, it's approximately here, and you can find the radius, and then the symmetric matrix Q, which is identity matrix here, defines a sphere which doesn't contain any further lattice points. Yeah, that's the empty sphere construction. So and inside of this sphere, um, always measured with respect to Q, you don't, don't find any more lattice points. 
And that's a deadly polyhedron. And of course, it can happen that it's not a polytope anymore. And this happens when the positive, when the matrix Q is not positive definite, but only positive semi definite. So then it can happen that it's a polyhedra completely yeah, strips. Um, and then these delivery polyhedra, they will be used um, to define these uh, triangles. But I think for time reasons, I, I will do this um, tomorrow. Yeah, so tomorrow I will continue here. I want to show you um, how you can define the Voronoi second reduction theory using this construction of the polyhedra. And then I want to show you uh, how you can use this theory to do some optimization of lattices. For example, uh, we look at the sphere covering problem.